Um, and then it's just taking a moment to log and I just don't wanna hold anyone else longer for it. So we'll go ahead and start. I'm gonna go ahead and switch over everything over to Tanya while everything is loading. Are you doing a countdown, Tisa? Should I just go ahead and get into it? Uh, you should be able to go ahead and I'm recording now. So go ahead and you may begin. Good evening. Welcome to Cincinnati Preschool Chat. Thank you for joining us for our part two series, Vaccinations. And I'm so excited because we're here with the wonderful Dr. Frank again, um, just talking to us about what we need to know. Um, so I'm here, Florence Malone, the Outreach and Enrollment Manager for Cincinnati Preschool Promise. We have Sydney Gardner, our Provider Coordinator with Cincinnati Preschool Promise, and we have Dr. Frank from Children's Hospital and a couple other people in the background. We appreciate everyone for being here this evening. So Dr. Frank, you were so insightful on the last meeting we had with regards to vaccinations. And parents had a lot of questions. In fact, we went beyond our hour. And so there are additional questions that the parents had, which is why we're doing part two. And okay. so I wanna go ahead and get you right into it. Um, just tell me your, your, you know, I know you're a doctor and everything, but tell me a little bit about the benefit and the reason why we need vaccinations or reason why our children need them. Because there's okay. a lot of people who think at this point they don't need them. Well, so, you know, one of the uh, things, let's go back to the year 1900. So not that long ago, 120 years ago, is that one out of five children died before they were five years of age. One out of five, that's 20% of kids died before they made it to five. And almost all of those deaths were due to vaccine preventable illnesses. And so that's why, you know, there's really, to me, why they're so important. To, to me, there's really two things, the most important things that we've done in medicine. And of course, I'm an infectious disease doctor, so I'm biased. But first one is washing our hands. And the second one is vaccines. And that, you know, a lot of people don't know about um, the routine childhood illnesses because of vaccines, and that's a good thing. And we don't want people to know what they're like because they're not always benign, that uh, kids can get really sick. And so one of the things, I don't know if I can maybe just um, share the screen for a second. Let me go and show a couple mm -hmm. slides, show a couple slides that maybe just to help illustrate my point. Um, if I can make it work. There it goes. So this is uh, looking at different diseases and um, what's happened with them because of vaccines. So diphtheria, so this column here is a number of different diseases. And this is how many there used to be, how many cases a year there used to be um, before vaccines. So this is a little bit older slide, but it's still pretty um, relevant and pretty accurate. So diphtheria is a very serious throat infection. Oops, that there used to be almost 175,000 cases before vaccines, now there's zero and it's a 100% decrease. If you look at measles, we've had a 99.9% .9 decrease, mumps a 95%, whooping cough or pertussis almost a 90%. So all of these diseases, which used to be incredibly common, are basically gone, or at least they kept at bay. And that's because of vaccines. And that, you know, so one of the things, like I said, a lot of times people don't realize that these diseases are still there. And one of the things that I was very nervous about um, during the early part of COVID is that people weren't going to the pediatrician or their family doctor for routine child checks because they were concerned and understandably so that their child might get COVID by going to the doctor's office. And so we saw a pretty big drop in routine vaccination. And we were really worried that we were gonna see big outbreaks of um, measles and pertussis. Luckily that we've been able to um, get back on track and have had a, um, a good immunization rate again. But you know, these diseases all exist. There's only one, one infection we've eradicated from earth and that's smallpox. All the rest of these diseases and plenty more um, still exist and are still there and vaccines are what's keeping them away. So maybe I'll just go to the first as far as like, so how do vaccines work? And what the vaccines do is that they prevent diseases that can be dangerous or even deadly. And the vaccines greatly reduce the infection. I mean, what they do is that basically vaccines are fooling our body to think that you've been exposed to that bacteria or virus 
And so our body will make an immune response to protection without us actually really getting sick. And so then if we're exposed to the virus or bacteria, we have antibodies and we keep from getting sick. And so that, you know, so what happens after an infection? So if you, if somebody's not immunized or not protected against the disease, so the first time the body encounters a germ, it can take a long time, even a couple of weeks um, before our body is able to make a good, a good immune response. And that's why we get sick. And so after the infection, we do have a protective ability and, and we're not then getting sick again with the same thing. But with that first infection, you can get really sick. And, and a lot of kids, as I mentioned, you know, 20% of kids died in the first five years of life. Um, and many of those or most of those were from vaccine preventable infections. Um, I'm not going to go through. Go ahead. Real quick, because I did um, have a parent ask a question. Sure. They wanted to know, do vaccines work on viruses and bacteria? Yes. And so the um, we have <clears throat> vaccines against both. So um, rotavirus is a virus. You can hear that virus in the name. Influenza is a virus. Um, measles is a virus, mumps is a virus, rubella is a virus. Um, and so, yes, we have a lot of um, viral vaccines. And for adolescents, the HPV, human papillomavirus, um, is a very important vaccine. So we, and then for bacteria, it's like for against bacteria called pneumococcus or haemophilus or meningococcus. Um, so yes, there's um, vaccines against both bacteria and viruses that we routinely give to kids. And so... And Go ahead. Go on, um, because when I think of vaccines, um, that's what I think of. I think of, of children. I don't mm -hmm. really think about adults getting vaccines. I mean, well, that's a great that's a great question. So, yeah, you want you know, it... People got vaccines early on when they were children, and then right. so my question personally: Does vaccines wear off? Some of them. Um, and so, you know, and so this slide here, you know, is looking at specifically about kids, but we do have um, vaccines and for younger, this is for younger kids, but we have um, vaccines for older kids too. So we um, give them a boost with um, this vaccine here that, that is a little bit different, but basically the DTaP, we boost them with that, um, that we then offer the meningococcal vaccine, the meningitis vaccine, and influenza vaccines, and the HPV. And then as we're getting into adulthood, um, vaccines that are very important. If you're 60 and above, please go get your shingles vaccine um, because they're very effective and you don't want to get shingles because they not only hurt um, while you have it, um, some people can have pain for months after the infection. So um, there's two different vaccines against shingles that are available. And there's also a vaccine for adults um, that are in the same age group, like 60 and above for um, pneumococcus, which is a type of bacteria that causes uh, pneumonia. Um, and still as adults, we need to get that flu vaccine every year. But, you know, people were asking the question about viruses. So this is rotavirus. It's a virus. Hepatitis B is a virus. Um, these three are um, bacteria, the diphtheria, the tetanus, and pertussis. This is a bacteria, this is a bacteria, this is a virus. So you can see there's a combination of um, vaccines that are against viruses and against um, bacteria. So go ahead if there's other questions and I'll skip maybe, well, I'll go maybe just oh, to no, give- you go ahead yep. and I'll hold off All on right. some questions. All right. So- I thought it was very interesting. So thank you for sharing with us. So what I wanted to show here is to give people kind of an understanding about vaccine development. Because over the last year, um, we have gone very quickly. So typically, going from a vaccine candidate to phase three, which is where we're doing a big study, is oftentimes five or 10 years. So a lot of people, their questions have been with COVID, you know, how did we, oops, how did we go so, how did we go so quickly? And part of it is that we had technology available to be able to do um, the testing quickly. And the other one of the things too, is that with the government providing funds um, with the Operation Warp Speed, uh, that made it easier for the companies too, because to develop a vaccine, it costs around three to $400 million to um, develop a vaccine from all the way from this candidate vaccine to registration, three or $400 million. Um, so when the government provided the funds, that took away a lot of the concern about you know, how are we going to pay for it? 
Um, and so that's one of the things too that helped be able to push things forward because there wasn't the continuous need to go find additional funds to do your testing that the government provided the, the funds. And that's one of the things too, as far as that, if people are telling you that you have to pay for a COVID vaccine, that's not right. So something's wrong there. They may, you may get charged for the pharmacist or the nurse to do an injection cost, but you shouldn't be paying for the vaccine. So if somebody's telling you, I'm going to send you the bill for a vaccine, there's something wrong there. I would be worried as far as that uh, somebody's um, maybe trying to scam me or something. Is that with any vaccine for children? No, no. So, okay. well, maybe, kind of, kind of. And that, but for the COVID vaccine, the government um, has already purchased all those. For children that are at a lower socioeconomic level, there's what's called the um, VFC, which is vaccine for children. When, unfortunately, well, when the, at, when the law was first developed, it was meant, just as I said, vaccine for children. And it was to provide free vaccines for any child in the United States. And some of the legislators said, well, what about a very rich child? And they said, well, yeah, it's for children. And we're not looking at their economic background, it's for children. And the legislators didn't like that. And they said, well, we're gonna put an economic cap on there. And so that depending on where you are economically, if you qualify for the VFC, those are free of charge. Um, but, uh, but for the routine vaccine series, um, no, those would um, have a charge with them. But the, the COVID-19, are different because uh, the government did pay for the development of the vaccines. So um, we've, we've really, we've paid for them already. So we're not, we shouldn't be paying for them again. But so for here, just as, go ahead. I'm sorry, is there a question? No, no, I'm sorry, doctor. I didn't mean to interrupt you. You were still going, go ahead, please. Okay, so, but basically just in this slide, so phase one, what that means, that's the first time we're using a vaccine in a person. And so we're usually having a few people, maybe um, 20, 30 people to get an idea of how well the um, vaccine with the safety and um, how well it's tolerated. And if it looks okay here, then we go to phase two where we increase the number maybe into the hundreds. And again, we're looking at safety and now we're looking at our immune response. And then for phase three, whoop, whoops, um, for phase three, what we're looking at here is safety, the immunogenicity, and then the protective effect. So the studies for COVID-19 vaccines that have been reported like for Pfizer and Moderna and Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca and now Novavax, um, those are all phase three, phase three studies here. And that's to look at how well the um, vaccine prevented infection. And then after they finish this information, all this information, it gets sent to the FDA and the Food and Drug Administration, and they make a decision about licensure. Um, and then even after licensure, we still have other studies that go on to really to check the safety and to be watching things. So this is a very detailed process, um, a very rigid process that we have to go through with every vaccine. And the reason I'm going through this in detail is just trying to give parents an idea of the, the steps that go through to get to a licensed vaccine. It's not just like somebody says, okay, we're gonna develop a vaccine. We're gonna put it in the immune schedule. That's not the way it works. Um, it really takes a, a, a long time to go through all these different steps. And especially if you're adding a new vaccine to the current pediatric schedule, we then have to do trials where we give the new vaccine with or without the other vaccines to make sure that the new vaccine isn't adversely or badly affecting the vaccines we're already using. Um, and so let me just go one last kind of thing here as far as, well, this is, I think, an important slide for people to understand too, is that one of the things that people can do is spin statistics. And depending on how you spin the statistics, you can come out with a very different impression. So this was about 20 years ago, we've, but I'll show you another slide. We've had uh, things not that long ago in Ohio, is that there was an outbreak of measles in Colorado. So 17 children developed measles. 10 of the children that, were, that had developed measles had been immunized. So people, the, the newspaper said, well, look, 59% of the cases happened in people that were uh, immunized. So the vaccine's no good. You shouldn't get the vaccine. This is terrible. Well, what you need to do is really look at the rest of the story. There were 625 children exposed to the measles 
609 of those had received the measles vaccine. So 10 out of 609 developed measles or a 1.6% attack rate. So they were 98.4% pr protected. Of the 16 children that were not immunized, almost half of those developed measles. So if you compare the rates here to here, that the, the vaccine decreased the rate of infection by almost 20 times. And so, but people don't sell it like this because this doesn't sell newspapers. This would say, well, why in the world didn't you go get vaccinated? But if you sell it like this, oh, vaccines are bad. You know, you don't want to get vaccines and makes people nervous. This though is the important part of the story about why vaccines are so important and why you really need to have the whole story. Um, and in Ohio, a few years ago, there were 383 cases in a, occurred of measles that occurred primarily among unvaccinated Amish. And so what happened, they were, um, had a very good intention. They went to the Philippines for a humanitarian mission and they landed unknowingly right in the middle of a big outbreak of measles in the Philippines. And so the Amish were under vaccinated against measles and they got measles and they got back on the plane and came back to Ohio, but they weren't sick during a trans transit. They didn't get sick until after they got back into Ohio and passed the virus among their community. And it took the Ohio Department of Health about two to three months to be able to get this outbreak under control, to be getting everybody vaccinated. And people said, oh, well, the Amish just won't get vaccinated. And people said, oh, I'm not sure that's true or not. And so they did surveys and they went to the elders in the, on the Amish community. And they said, why didn't you get your children vaccinated? Why didn't your adults get vaccinated? And the answer was, we didn't think it was important. We didn't think it was necessary. We didn't understand. And as soon as they understood and they saw the number of people in their community that were getting vaccinated, they lined up to get vaccinated and they, the Ohio Department of Health was able to immunize about 95% of the people in the community. So it wasn't the Amish were anti-vaccine, they just didn't realize that it was important to continue to vaccinate. And so here's a couple of things as far as where kind of myths is that people talk about, one of them is that measles, mumps, rubella causes autism. That's not true. And just like I was showing you in the data there about the measles vaccine and about how the unimmunized group had almost a 20 times higher increase in rate compared to the ones that were vaccinated. If you take a group of children that have received MMR and you take a group, and there are some children that have not received MMR, and you look at the rates of autism between the two groups, it's identical. Of course, you're gonna see autism in children that have MMR because 90 to 95% of the children in the United States receive MMR. So you're gonna, you're gonna see a lot of things that happen in children who've had MMR, but it's not the MMR that's causing it. The thimerosal, which is a preservative that we use, um, in vaccines has been taken out because of the people raised a concern. It's a what's called methylmercury. And so it, it's a preservative. It's very short lived. It goes out of our body. It doesn't cause a problem, but people heard that word mercury and got very nervous. So a friend of mine is a pediatrician in Texas and she used the analogy. So methylmercury, um, excuse me, a, a thimerosal is ethylmercury. Methylmercury is dangerous. So the analogy they use is that while ethylmercury and methylmercury sound very similar, it's kind of like the difference between ethyl alcohol and methyl alcohol. Methyl alcohol is antifreeze while ethyl alcohol is a Bud Light. So that sometimes the things can sound very similar, but they're very different. So thimerosal does not cause a problem. People said, well, I don't want to give these vaccines because it overloads the immune system. And I'll show you in the next slide kind of information why that's really not true and that vaccines contain impurities and that so it used to be with the pertussis vaccine the whooping cough vaccine it was a bit of a dirty vaccine but we've really cleaned that up and so this is just to show you in in 1960 of just giving these um three vax or four vaccines that children had over 3200 antigens mostly it's because of this uh, the pertussis which was not a very clean vaccine but now we've made this pertussis an acellular, so it's just the proteins from the pertussis 
we now have a total antigen of only 123, 126. So my contention is if in 1960, children were able to get 3,200 antigens and not get sick or overload your immune system, it's hard to argue that 123 will overload your immune system. Another thing is that kids on the whole, and I'm sure any of you with young children will attest to this, although this year has been an aberrancy, kids are typically sick a lot in their first couple of years of life with colds. And the average child gets eight to 10 colds a year for their first two years of life. And with each cold, they're getting about eight to 10 antigens. So they're getting about 100 antigens a year just from colds. So they're getting more antigens, more immune exposure from colds than they do from the whole immune vaccine system. And just as the last slide. Yep. Yep. We have a quick question. Yeah. One of the questions someone wanted uh, to know is, so with the vaccinations, will they prevent, um, will they prevent children from getting COVID or will they prevent adults passing COVID to children or will they sure. prevent children from passing it so, to adults? Vice and that's, so that's a great, great segue into things. And that I'll, I'll just tell you this last slide and I'll go answer that question you just answered, uh, asked. So one of the things I would just say here as far as looking at, these are different things that we do as for pre in prevention medicine in the United States. And this is what's called qualities or quality of life years saved. So that if somebody lives one year longer, you saved one year of life. And if 100 people live 100, one year longer, that's 100 years of life. So if you look here, the childhood immunizations, the reason they have a break in the scale here is because it's so much here, it wouldn't even fit on the chart compared to, I mean, cervical cancer, pap smears are very important to do. Colorectal cancer, your sigmoidoscopy, your colonoscope, very important to do. All these other kind of things, breast cancer checks, they're all very important compared to the vaccines um, and, and more lost and all of these other things basically combined. Um, and so with that, I will go, I'll stop slides and I will go back and answer your question. And so that the, um, and your aunt, the question would be as far as what do COVID-19 vaccines do? And so uh, they really were looking at two things. The first thing is a direct effect so that you yourself don't get sick. Um, you've been exposed to the virus, you don't get sick. And the other thing is the indirect effect so that even if you have an infection, so you have the virus in the nose, um, you may not pass it to somebody else. So that, that's what we're hoping for is that to be getting a good indirect effect too. So that the children are very, so COVID is a respiratory virus. It's one that lives in our nose and in our lungs. That children are very, very good about spreading respiratory viruses to other kids, to other family members. Um, and so that by immunizing the children, the hope would be even though the, the likelihood of getting severely infected in a child is low, it's not zero. Um, but one of the other big things is that they don't get it and then they don't have it in their nose and they're not passing it to, to somebody else. Um, you know, if you, there was a study that was recently um, uh, printed from the CDC where they looked at a primary case in the household. So somebody comes home, they have COVID. And then they were looking at what's the likelihood of other people in the home um, getting infected as about 50%. So one out of two people that are exposed to that primary case will get COVID. Um, what they found is that the rate was about the same regardless of the age. The rate was about the same regardless of the um, race. But what they found is that men uh, were more likely to get secondary infections than women. And when I was talking to women about that data, they said it's obvious because men are messier than women and that uh, they don't use as good of um, public health so that it, that was obvious to us that uh, men would be more likely to get infected than women. But um, so that men were about 60% and the women was about 47%. Um, so it was, it was a, a big difference, um, but on the whole, it's about half. Uh, so it's not 100%, but there is a lot of tr secondary transmission of the virus. Dr. Fritz, I heard you say something about uh, a dirty vaccination as you were showing the slides. How effective do you think our safety testing is? I think our, so 
when people talk about a dirty or clean vaccine, what they're meaning with that is that it's not a just that antigen or just that um, piece of the virus or bacteria. So the, the pertussis before used to be you just killed the pertussis bacteria and that's what you use for your vaccine. So it didn't give you pertussis, but a lot of kids got um, fevers, they got swollen legs and it made them feel lousy. Um, and so that's why we um, updated and modified the vaccine. I don't mean by dirty as far as being unsafe as far as unsterile or anything like that. They're not. And so um, the, the side effects of vaccines are, are typically mild, um, that, you know, they are possible to have some, but the usual things you, you see is that uh, at the site of infection, uh, site of injection, that you're having some redness, you're having some pain. Um, you may, sometimes kids will get some fever, um, but most of the kids really do quite well. I mean, you know, obviously it's a shot. So, I mean, it hurts and that some of the oral, some of the vaccines are oral, but um, most of them are shots and, you know, the kids are going to cry because you're, you're sticking them with a needle. But as far as any serious long-term side effects on the vaccines, they're really very unusual. And if you, again, if you compare the side effects of a vaccine to the side effects of the, of the disease itself, the diseases always are 20, 30, 50, 100, 1,000 times more likely to cause um, severe side effects than the, than the vaccines. Dr. Frank, we also had somebody ask um, a personal question. Huh? They wanted to know, how does one get involved in this type of work? How did I get into vaccinology? Yes. So thank you for asking. Um, so um, when I was in medical school, I in the first place decided that I enjoyed working with kids, um, partly because kids are growing organisms that they're, um, and that if we can help them along, we're giving them a whole life ahead of them, much like you are in your daycare, as far as that you're giving them the formation to be able to be strong and healthy and productive citizens for a very long time. So that's why I liked pediatrics. And then one of the things about pediatrics that is really a mainstay of pediatrics is vaccination because it's, as I was showing you with that slide, one of the best ways to prevent um, problems. And, and it's much better to prevent a problem than to treat a problem. And so with a vaccine, so I very much enjoy working with families and treating the kids, but then I'm working with one at a time, right? Um, and so in a busy clinic, I may have 10, 15 kids in the clinic that day. But when we're working with a vaccine against COVID, a vaccine against flu, a vaccine against diarrheal diseases, you literally can impact the lives of millions of people. Um, and so that's really what I was kind of drew me to it is the public health uh, ability that we can really um, provide a lot of um, improved health and prevention to people because prevention is really much better than to treat. Um, treat means you've already gotten sick and now we're trying to get you back to health. Whereas prevention is we keep you from getting sick in the first place. And I, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I can sometimes I feel as though um, we are more of a treatment country versus a prevention country. Oh, not kinda, we are. I'm, I mean, it's, it's, it's shifting in medical school some, but still medical school is still taught as um, treating disease. And so of keeping health is, um, it's, in, it's increasing in the education system. And it's something where it's becoming more of a front line in people's minds of think thought. But as doctors, we still treat disease a lot more than we prevent. So what happens or, or what advice would you give a mom to maybe maybe her child miss the shots early on? Is it such a thing as a catch up with vaccination? Sure. So that? it's never too late to get vaccinated. OK, and that. Um, and yes, there are catch-up um, schedules. And so that the typical is we space the vaccines about two months apart for the children. So it's usually two months, four months, six months. And then depending on the doctor's office, somewhere between nine and 12 months. And then there's one usually 15 to 18 months. But those two, four, and six, you can give uh, one, two, and three. You can give them as short as a month apart. And um, we can give a lot of vaccines at once because I showed you that one 
um, slide there is that you're not going to overload the immune system that your son and daughter probably is not going to be real happy with you if, if you gave them a lot of the vaccines at once. Um, but other than that, it's not going to hurt them. And there certainly um, is the ability to, to catch up rather quickly. So let me ask you a question. What do you say to the parent that has a child or have children who have received vaccinations and say they got vaccinations for chicken pox and then mm -hmm. three weeks later, one of the children gets chicken pox. What do you say to that parent? That, that wouldn't be just a by, by chance example, would it? I mean, you know, that you know somebody that three weeks later got chicken pox. Um, so um, that's a great question. Is that, um, so chicken pox, um, the vaccine prevents uh, about, the first sh shot prevents a disease in about 85% um, of people. Um, but what we found out is that if you only gave one dose is that about 15% of kids will get chicken pox, although it's very mild. So I remember well having chicken pox and my sister brought it home to me and I had it when I was in about seventh grade and I was in misery. Um, we have them all over. Even with the, with the um, vaccine associated chicken pox, you're usually getting in the range typically of 20 or 30 or something like that and they're not nearly as sick. Now, after that first dose, what can happen is that it's not really that you're getting chicken pox, but what it is is that it is a live virus and some people, um, and that's about the time, somewhere two to three weeks after the vaccine is that they'll get a few lesions and that's just um, the chicken pox in the, in the vaccine. But it, it doesn't, you typically don't get a full blown case of chicken pox. I mean, it's possible, but usually what you're seeing is people getting a, a few um, blisters here and there um, that, but not the full blown disease. So we I mean, I guess I guess one thing maybe try to answer one other way is that there's no vaccine we have that's 100 percent effective. The covid vaccines that we've seen with Pfizer and Moderna have been 95 percent. That's really phenomenal um, that most of our vaccines are around 90 percent. Um, and so that, you know, if you happen to be the one in 10 or one in five and 100 that didn't respond, if you have all these other people around you that are protected, the, the likelihood that virus or bacteria is going to find you is really pretty small. So that the other thing is that even if you um, didn't respond to the vaccine, if we have a very good protection of everybody else, that's still going to help protect you. That's what we call that herd immunity. And that's a good segue because we did have a question someone wanted to know or was asking if you could explain the difference between the three vaccinations or mm -hmm. if, is there is there a difference because you know one vaccination you only have to take one shot the other one you have to take two shots so can you help us understand the difference between the sure. three sure um so the i think of um as three different platforms there's the moderna and the pfizer that are basically the same the johnson and johnson and the um, AstraZeneca are basically the same. And then there's another vaccine that's uh, called Novavax, um, which is a third platform. So the um, Pfizer and Moderna, what are called mRNA vaccine. And think of mRNA as kind of like the blueprint for your body. Is that so if you're going to build a house, or you're going to be whatever, you're going to have the blueprints, and that's going to tell you what to put here, what to put there, what to build. So the mRNA is our blueprint. It tells our body, make this protein. Um, and, that, and so it could be a protein for hair. It could be a protein for skin. It could be a protein for your heart, whatever. You know, so it's going to build a protein. So what we're doing with the, the COVID vaccine is we're taking the gene, that mRNA, for the spike protein, and that's our vaccine. And so we're injecting that into the people. And then our body takes that spike protein gene and makes a spike protein, and then puts that on the surface of our cells. And it's basically kind of waving and saying, hey, I'm here, I'm foreign, I'm not supposed to be here, make an antibody against me. So that's the way the mRNA works. The, the other vaccines for the Johnson & Johnson and the AstraZeneca is that what you're doing there is you're taking a very common virus called an adenovirus, which in most people just cause a cold. 
and then you're putting that gene inside the adenovirus. And so you're using the adenovirus as a way to bring the gene into the cell. And then once that gene gets into the cell, it does just like the mRNA vaccine is that our body then makes the, the spike protein, puts that on the surface of the cell. And again, starts waving around out there saying, come attack me. This is the immune response you're supposed to make because I'm telling you I'm infected. You're not really infected, but you're kind of fooling your immune system to make the immune response. And then the third vaccine, which you probably haven't heard as much about, um, but it's one that um, will be having more testing in the United States, is Novavax. And so Novavax has finished their phase three, um, and that that is more like the typical flu vaccine. It's you're giving in this one, you're giving the spike protein itself. With the Pfizer and Moderna, or with the Johnson and Johnson and AstraZeneca, you're giving the gene for the spike protein, and then our body is making the the spike protein. With the Novavax, we're giving the spike protein as the vaccine. So um, those are the ones that are I think will be available soon. The as you mentioned, the Johnson and Johnson is a, um, being marketed right now or look, used as a one-dose vaccine that um, they're actually doing studies. They went back, Johnson & Johnson has started a study on two doses to see as if it gives them any different response versus one dose. Um, but right now it's being looked at as one dose. The advantages of the Johnson & Johnson, it's uh, less expensive. So in countries that where um, they haven't paid for the vaccine already, uh, you know, having a less expensive vaccine is gonna be important. The Johnson & Johnson is also able to be stored in a refrigerator, which makes it much easier. So I was in Egypt for eight years with the Navy doing um, medical research. And that um, there, if you had a vaccine that had to be stored in a freezer, um, that would make it much more difficult to um, deliver. And so having a vaccine that can be kept in a refrigerator or even better in room temperature um, is significant and, and makes it a lot easier to administer. The um, so Dr. Frank, let me yep. just intervene real, really quick because yeah. I'm interested in knowing your thoughts around this because once again, it, it seems kind of to me like usually um, with all other vaccines, we have pressed the issue of children um, getting vaccinated at the infancy stage versus right now we're trying to get all our adults vaccinated and we haven't said anything about our children being vaccinated as of yet. And so that's a concern as we go back and forth for preschools, because as you said earlier, the one thing that we love about our children is because they're kind of little germ magnets. Here. <laughs> is that not a concern that we should be trying to get them vaccinated right now? So um, yes, they are germ magnets. Is that, uh, I, like I said, I was in the Navy and so I would be transferred uh, from base to base about every three or four years. And um, I knew that first uh, six months to a year that I was a new base that I was gonna be sick a lot because the kids were gonna give me all the viruses that are in that area. Um, so uh, we have done studies in, in teens from 12 up to 17. Um, and those um, have been completed for the vaccination. We're just um, finishing up analyzing the results. And then I think we're actually gonna be starting writing up that paper to be able to publish for the Pfizer for the adolescents really pretty soon. Um, we're actually starting on Monday. Uh, so in whatever, three days and that uh, four days for um, vaccinating children five to 12, uh, five to, up to the 12th birthday. So five to 11 years of age. And that, um, and then looking at uh, doing some of the, that age group and if they're, um, the safety looks okay with that, because with any study we do, safety is the number one thing. And if it looks okay, then what we're gonna look at doing is going two to five years of age and then getting looking at the dose there. And if that looks okay, go down to potentially as low as six months to two years of age. So really three age groups, the five to 11, two to five, and then six months to, to, to two years. Um, the, I think the vaccine will be, I think there'll be one or more vaccines licensed for children 12 and above before the next school year starts. So um, August, maybe July. For younger kids, I think it's gonna be more about a year from now because we just um, have just started the studies and we're gonna need to um, have the data before we can um, go to parents. I mean, I need to have that so I can talk to a parent and say, 
this is safe. This is a good thing to do. How, how, how do we make our parents feel safe about vaccinating? Going to school? Or how do we make them? Well, all above. How do we make them feel safe about the vaccination? How do we empower our providers with information? How do we make them feel safe about going to preschool? Sure. I mean, you know, it's, it's a concern. We haven't seen really okay. high cases in children, but at the same time, um, numbers in preschool have fallen off a little bit because right. we weren't bringing them to preschool as much. Right. And then also too, as if parents are working from home too, then the, the, the uh, social structure changes a little bit. Although I've talked to a lot of my friends where they've been trying to work from home. I said, oh my God, when can we have the kids go back to school? You know, but that, uh, so the um, one thing as far as that in Ohio, as of next Monday, the governor said the vaccine um, can be available to anyone 19. I don't know. That, I think they dropped it to 18. I never could understand why they made 19. And then for, if you can have access to the Pfizer vaccine, 16 and above. So your, your teachers, your staff um, should be able to have access to the vaccine. Um, our supply issue is getting better. Um, and so I, I have a daughter that's 29 and a son that's 25 that we're very happy to hear that there's, um, you know, vaccines going to be available because they've been wanting to get immunized, um, that we are increasing our supply. That's one of the nice things about having not only Pfizer and Moderna and Johnson and Johnson, and I think soon AstraZeneca, that will have lots of different vaccine options. That so first of all, we really need to get our teachers, our hospital, I mean, our uh, school employees, day, daycare employees, everybody vaccinated because that'll be important. The other thing is for the kids, obviously in six months old, two years old, you can't do it that much. But in the older kids, they're really pretty good about wearing the masks. And I, you know, seeing them in clinic is that they have their different color masks and, the, and they're just kind of, it's just become a way of life for them. And that hopefully that won't be for very long, um, but they adapt the kids. That's another reason why I like being a pediatrician because the kids really adapt well, they, they accept change. We as adults don't accept change very well, but kids are pretty good at, at change. Um, and then, you know, I think as far as the other thing that we're seeing is that by having, if you're in an older group where you can have the kids wear masks, that um, even three feet is probably sufficient separation. I, I know as you're having infants, even that's not going to be possible, but, um, you know, the we're not needing to have quite as much separation as we thought we did. Um, and so I think those are the, the things I would say are positive, you know, and then, you know, I, I think it's going to end up being a, um, I, I think it's, it's because you have, you're going to have some people that will get um, infected, but most of the time, if you look at, where the kids are getting infected, it's not happening in schools. When they're doing the contact tracing in that, is that the vast majority of kids, they're getting the infection outside of the school setting. They're getting it when they're going to, as older kids, that they're going to parties or going to the mall or they're going to sports or they're doing other kinds of things where they're, where they're getting close to each other is where um, infections are happening. It's not really um, happening that much in the school setting. Now, the daycare, I know, is a little bit, different from uh, older kids in school. But, um, you know, I think of trying to have some of that separation, having the, uh, the adult workers um, vaccinated, I think that's, that can really um, help with uh, decreasing transmission. And so Dr. Frank, what, what I wanna ask you is because I know everybody is getting vaccinated and everything. Is it does that give us permission to take off our mask? I mean, <laughs> so, so, so that, no, that's, a, that's a great question. And that so the um, so the CDC Centers for Disease Control had their most recent um, uh, advice is that if you're in a private setting and everybody you know um, is coming that's had their vaccines, you can take off your masks. Um, but that's really of looking at being in a private setting and that um, in a public setting, we were, we're still looking at wanting to have the mask for a while. And the main reason is because we still don't have great data on 
if the vaccines prevent transmission. If we had really good data to show that the vaccines, we, like I told you that one study in Israel was really, really great data, but that's one study. And so we wanna get some more information. If we had really good information to say that the vaccine not only prevented the disease, but it prevented transmission, then I think it, it'll, be, it'll be faster to ditch the masks. The unfortunate thing is that I'm worried that in a, in a few weeks or so, we're gonna have a lot of vaccine and we're gonna have a lot of people that unfortunately haven't been vaccinated. And, and so that's one of the reasons that I've you know, come and talk and things like this is trying to provide information to people of what, why it's so important to be vaccinated. Yeah, I know for me that that's a concern as well um, as we try to go back to some normal way of life. Um, I'm seeing more people in stores and everything without masks. And I'm like, when I see them, I'm wondering, like, did you have your vaccination? Did you well, that's that's the problem, you know, as far as that people lie like dogs. I mean, you know, and so that, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm vaccinated. Uh huh. Sure. Um, and that uh, so, yeah, I have that exact concern, too, is that people will say they've done something they haven't really done. Yeah, and so it's just a concern. And then I, I had do, um, I see Jamie has joined us, so I do want to welcome her. Um, Jamie, we appreciate you giving us a few minutes of your time because I know you, um, you, you were busy and everything. You were over there on the west side making changes, so we appreciate you. Um, and I, I see her there, but I am, I am so sorry. Let me apologize to everybody. I, I think I was cooking on the wrong meeting. And I was like, I'm here alone. <laughs> but I am with, um, I, oh, this is terrible. How are you, Dr. Frank? I'm I am doing with well. my nursing students. They are finishing up. I teach um, nursing students and I'm with them. And today is their last clinical. And so I was doing some, um, I was well, doing, uh-oh. That's, uh -oh, that's a very important. So, yeah, it's been, I know, it's been ridiculous, but I do apologize to everyone. No, and thank no. you all for even, <laughs> I am so sorry. That, I'm so like, oh my God. The students needed their mom for the last day. They can't, come on now. You can't, you can't just ditch them on the last day, you know? Yeah, so we just appreciate her even showing up because I know how busy she is. But I do, before we get ready, because I want to be conscious of everybody's time, before we get ready to um, get off of here and, and in preschool chat, I do have like two more questions that came up. Well, Jamie can either one can answer this. So people are getting vaccinations, but some people are still getting the virus. And I know that you said um, it's not 100% cure all and stuff, but can you just give us a little bit more? Because that's kind of making people leery of, of you know, the vaccination just a little bit. Like, why take it if I'm still going to get it? And I understand we're not going to get it as as harsh, but at the same time, there's no studies around it. So can you can you help elaborate a little bit? I'll try. And that, um, so the best vaccine would prevent all infections. So no one um, had the virus in them and they would have no side effects. But what I'm really worried about is the people that are being hospitalized, the people in the intensive care unit or dying from the virus. So if we could, if our vaccines can prevent people from being hospitalized, that's where I think we really need to target because we get colds all the time, right? I mean, if people say, eh, you know, got a cold, uh, but life goes on, you get a cold. Is it the problem with COVID is that um, we don't have immunity and that's so that you don't just get a cold that you can get much sicker. So if you look at the saying, if we're trying to prevent people from being hospitalized, from being in the intensive care unit, from dying, all of the vaccines that we have available now are 90 plus percent effective for doing that. So you're right, you may still have an infection. You may still have some cough, runny nose, some achy stuff like that. But if that's the worst you get, I'll take that, you know, it's in, in that, so it keeps you from getting so sick that you're being hospitalized. Um, but, and then if we have a lot of people or most of our people getting vaccinated, um, it's not gonna, even if the vaccines don't work that well as far as preventing transmission, if we have everybody vaccinated, there's nobody to transmit it to anyway. So you're right, is that some people still do get infected, but the, the 
serious infections, the ones that are putting you in the hospital, the ones that are killing you, um, have basically gone uh, away with the vaccine. So that is my understanding as well, not to interrupt Dr. Frank, is that the vaccine, what the COVID vaccine does is, and, and I think that's the misconception of um, everyone, that everyone in the community setting has, is that the, the, the vaccine prevents you from getting COVID. That is not what it does. What it does, um, just kind of breaking it down a little bit further, is that it decreases the severity right. and the exacerbations of the symptoms that come with the COVID virus. And I, exactly. but I think the community has come to, I don't know where this came from. And don't get me wrong, I've been watching some commercials that it's have because we oversold it. it as such. You we can, oversold yeah, it. We, we got we oversold. overshot it by a far, we yeah. way overshot it. And I, and I tell people all the time, even the patients that come into the um, clinic, I say, hey, I came up in the era where we caught the chicken pox. They right. now have that varicella vaccine. You don't hear of it anymore. Does that mean that our children won't get chicken pox? It does not mean that they won't get them. It just won't look like the ones we had when we were little, where right. they were all over the place. It, you know what I mean? And so I think that that understanding has kind of has kind of helped some people. However, I, I do agree with you, Dr. Franklin, when you say that I think we're going to come up, we're going to come up to a time where we're going to have all these vaccines left. Yeah. We, I mean, I well, mean we, we, really... we oversold it. We overshot yeah. it. We did not educate correctly. We did not educate properly, at least on a community based level for people to then, you know what I mean? So, so well, uh, yes. And so I think what we have to do is to redirect people's understanding and expectations. And so, again, if you, you know, when I've given a lot of these talks that people said, well, you know, our church stopped having prayer service because there were, the pastor was telling so many people that were dying. It was, it was so depressing because the number of people dying. That's what we want to keep from happening. We want to keep from people being in the hospital and that, and it's, it would be great if we could have a vaccine to prevent the common cold. And that's what COVID, what's what coronaviruses usually do is give you a cold. Um, but if we, if we set our sights on our vaccines are to prevent us from getting very ill, our vaccines are to allow us so we can have church gatherings again, school gatherings that go to plays, go to the movies, go to restaurants, go back to normal. And if that's our expectation, then all those vaccines will allow us to achieve that. Will some people still get a runny nose? Yeah. Or some people still get a cough? Yeah. But I think most people won't care that much as far as that, other than they may say, what do you mean? I still got COVID, but okay. Okay, you got COVID, but you're still going to work every day. You're still in, you're not in the ground. Um, and, and that's where I think that it wasn't purposeful, but I mean, it was, the, the the results were so good they far exceeded what we thought and then and, and it really kind of raised people's expectation to unrealistic expectations but if you if you kind of dial them back a little bit to saying this this vaccine is going to keep you from being hospitalized it's and it's going to keep you from dying then yeah yeah yeah, I, and I think that's where we failed because what started happening is just as fast as people were getting the vaccine, some people that were getting the vaccine were also getting ill, like just little side mm -hmm. effects from it. Mm -hmm. And so oh, that, that number was increasing just like, you know what I mean? And then mm -hmm. that's, what, that's what grew the mistrust and the distrust in the vaccine. But like you said, I think we oversold it and we didn't sell the right information with it, but you're right. It, I, I'd rather have that runny nose. I'd rather have those <laughs> sniffles. I'd rather have than to be in the ground. And a lot of people who have comorbidities, who probably are the ones who need it, are the ones who are most skeptical about it. Right. And that's why I come and talk to people and answer their questions. And hopefully that we can make all of you disciples and going out and help pass the word. Um, and so that uh, if we work on things one person at a time, um, then, you know, pretty soon we can have a, a number of people that are comfortable with getting vaccinated. Well, I know for me, um, it's definitely been a pleasure having both of you all here to um, talk to our families and our providers and explain to them the who's and what. And so I'm happy to have you guys a part of the Cincinnati Peace Promise Network. I appreciate you all. Um, this has been a wonderful preschool promise chat. And we've got information. Um, 
Jamie, I appreciate the time you were here. So, oh my goodness, I am so sorry, everybody. I am so sorry, but so so for this, I owe one down. I owe you guys one. That's I owe you guys. Even if Dr. Frank can't be there, I owe you guys one. So so take my owe you. I, I will. <laughs> no, that's fine. And so as always, uh, just appreciate both of you guys and keep up the good work. Keep yourself safe. Um, this has been Cincinnati Preschool Promise Chat. Um, we thank you everybody for joining us this evening. Look out for information on our next preschool chat. We will be talking about evaluations and assessments, the importance of them, the reason why our children need them, how do they work and all that other good stuff. So thank you for joining us here at Preschool Chat. Good night.